A pop singer in Malaysia finds more success practicing black magic. And then we take a look at a story that I've actually hinted about quite a few times, but have never spoken about publicly. Today, I will tell you the time that I fought a witch. Today on Dead Rabbit Radio. Everyone, welcome back to another episode of Dead Rabbit Radio. I'm your host, Jason Carpenter. I'm having a great day. I hope you guys are having a great day, too. Remember, we're going to do a live episode, a live Thanksgiving episode. It's going to be 12 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. So grab your turkey or your tofu or nothing. (laughs) Maybe you're fasting that day. I don't know. And come and join us for a live episode. I don't know if I'm going to do an episode on Friday. The live episodes kind of drain me, plus all the, you know, turkey and everything. But definitely we're going to have that episode come out on Thursday. We're going to have all these other episodes coming out as well as normal. We'll see what's going on with the Friday episode. But while I'm trying to figure out what to do with that, let me introduce some of our legacy Patreons, Corio and Nicole. Corio and Nicole, they're coming in, they're doing some results. They're doing like a Cirque du Soleil routine, doing flips and stuff. And they land, they have matching leotards. Hi, Corey. Hi, Nicole. Thank you for supporting the show. You guys are going to be our captains, our pilots this episode. If you can't support the Patreon, I totally get it. Just help spread the word about the show really, really helps out a lot. So, Nicole, let's go ahead and put you in the Dead Rabbit Dirigible. Corio is going to be your first mate. Little skip- he has a cute little skipper uniform on. Look at that. That's so adorable. We are flying out to Malaysia. Specifically, we're headed out to Kampong Parus. That's in Ulu Dong. And then Hulu Tong is in Rabu Paeng. And all of those places are in Malaysia. So there. I'm just pointing down. I know exactly where it's at, don't you? I'm pointing down right at the region we're going to land down. <laughs> Nicole brings that dirigible down. We're all walking around in like uh, clothes <laughs> because you're not allowed to be naked in Malaysia. We're walking around in clothes. It's a sunny day. We're taking pictures. We're just tourists. And we see a poster on the side of a building, and it is for Malaysia's top pop star, Mona Fanday. But we notice that the poster is a little frayed. And the reason why the poster is sun-dried, flaking off, is because this is an older poster. You see, Mona wasn't one of Malaysia's top pop stars. However, she tried. She self-produced an album. She was able to do a couple performances on TV shows. But her career never really took off, so she went to the next best thing. Because power is what Mona craved, really. It wasn't about putting forth her art, but being recognized, being known, being somebody. And if you can't be a powerful person yourself, you need to be the power behind the powerful people. This story is really interesting. I'm actually surprised it's not more popular because some of the themes we're going to be talking about, you'll find very familiar with conspiracy theories going on to this very day. Mona leaves behind her pop music career and she becomes what's known as a BOMO. A BOMO is the Malaysian equivalent of a shaman or a witch doctor or a spiritual healer. But they were also known, some of them at least, to not just grind up a couple herbs and put them in your tea. <laughs> they let you know. They don't spike your tea. They're like, ha ha ha, now you're cured of all your diseases. And you didn't even know I was behind it. That you pay them money. You pay them money. They give you herbs, you know, little trinkets. This will help you find your lost love. A little, little, it's just a GPS. It's a GPS tracker you put on your love. But also she was doing a little bit of that black magic. A little bit of the dark arts. Now, it wasn't so much that she was placing curses on other people, but she was telling people that she could, for lack of a better term, make their wishes come true. Now, she didn't have a little shack in the middle of a swamp. She wasn't sitting on some dusty street corner reading palms. Her clientele very quickly became the rich and the powerful of Malaysia. Heads of state, high-level government associates, the rich and the powerful begin to visit her to get a little bit of that sweet, sweet magic she was weaving all over the country. Is she actually casting spells that are helping these people out? They believed it. And then we have Maslon Idiris enter the scene. He's an up-and-coming politician. He's just getting his foot wet in the super-corrupt swamp known as politics. And he hears of Mona, he knows her reputation, so he visits her to see if he can get some magical assistance. She says, come on by my house. We'll take care of it. Now, it's not free. 
It's going to cost you 2.5 million ringgits. And he's all, gold? That sounds like a lot. And when you run the conversion factor, it's actually a ton of money. It's $609,000 in U.S. dollars to get this done. She must have had a very well-established reputation. You're not dropping $25 at the local fortune tellers. If you're dropping $600,000, hopefully you've seen results. Hopefully you're not the first sucker in on this scheme. But he pays it. He give, writes off some land deeds for her and gives her some cash. July 18th, 1993, Mazlan goes to her house, and there he sees Mona, along with her husband, Mode, and their assistant, Jerami. And Mazlan goes, okay, so I want the power that I know you can grant me. I want to be a very successful politician. She goes, that's simple enough? Very, very simple spell, honestly. I need you to lay down on the floor. So he lays down on the floor. She goes, I need you to close your eyes. Closes his eyes. He hears the shuffling of feet around him. The carpet moving under his body every time someone steps closer. And then she says, wait for it. You'll soon feel money falling from heaven onto your face. We don't really know what Mazlan's thought process is. Because there's only a brief second between her saying that and an axe coming down and severing his head. Jerami was standing there waiting for the signal, and when she gave it, decapitated Maslan. They chopped up the body, disposed of it in a shack nearby their house for some bizarre reason. This is where the plan starts going. The plan started going sideways when they murdered a person, basically, but this is when it really starts going sideways. They chop up the body, hide it in a little shack nearby Mona's residence, and then take the money and just go about their lives. Mona actually goes and gets a facelift. She goes and buys a new car. I think it was a Jaguar. Living large, living large with that dead man's money. But you see, Maslon had actually been missing since July 2nd. People were already wondering what was going on with him because they saw him pull out a large amount of cash from his bank account and then disappeared. He was still alive until the 18th, but he didn't have any communication with the public. I don't know if he was wearing an Invisible Man suit. He borrowed all the money. He's like, oh, yeah, I want to get one of those cool suits I saw in that movie. He didn't do that. He unfortunately got his head chopped off. But it's interesting. He was missing for 16 days before he was actually murdered. The cops were already looking for him. But through a weird series of events, and it didn't actually say it in any of the articles I read, the police ended up narrowing their sights on Jerami, the assistant. And he broke very quickly, said where the body was, said what was going on. The cops go and arrest Mona. You'd wonder if she was surprised when cops walked into her house, but she did just have facelifts. So you wouldn't be able to tell. She's like, oh my God. Her face is totally frozen in place. Not a good facelift. They all get taken, hauled into court. The trial starts and Mona is smiling throughout the trial. That's a lot of times when you read these articles, they'll talk about how she was smiling. She seemed so content. She was on trial for murder. Some people say, that it was because she finally got the fame that she had wanted. She would call the people at the courthouse and the photographers taking a picture, her fans. That's why she always had a smile on her face. I think part of it, again, has to do with the shoddy facelift, but it could also just be the fame. All three are found guilty, and all three are sentenced to hang. In Malaysia, before you're executed, you get this. This sounds like torture. This sounds absolutely awful. A day or two before you're sentenced to death, you get to spend eight hours with your family. You're like, Jason, that's, that's awesome. That's what Thanksgiving's all about. Yeah, it is. But imagine like you having to hang out with someone who's going to die in, like, in a day. I mean, I guess you're just like, Jason, you're super heartless. But it's like you go and you hang out with your relative and she's like, hey, everyone, yeah, I murdered, I murdered that guy. There's no axes lying around, right? You're like looking around, making sure there's no sharp weapons. First, and here's the thing. One, it seems torturous because you know this is the last time, you know for a fact this is the last time you're going to see someone. Two, eight hours is a long time. Imagine if you were just like a cousin who like kind of knew Aunt Mona and you're like, oh man, you're like, did I bring a Game Boy? Did I bring a Game Boy? Were they invented in 1993? 
as Mona's like, I'm going to miss you guys so much. The little little dude's like, I'm so bored. <laughs> He's all drawn stuff. Eight hours is a long time to spend with somebody, anyone, whether or not they're going to die. It seems like torture for both people, psychological torture for the person who's going to die, and then actual torture for all the nephews and nieces who'd rather be at home than be here in this prison. She tells them, though, she says this comment quite a few times, apparently. I will never die. I will never die die but on november 1st 2001 they bring a last meal to these three defendants now mona and her husband said we don't want to eat anything we don't want a last meal we are going to sit here in contemplation as we move on from one existence to the next so on another thing that would probably be considered torture the prison officials go oh You want to have, like, this spiritual awakening before you die and all that stuff? But by law, we have to give you a last meal. So here's a bucket of Kentucky Fried Chicken. How can you be, like, on the spiritual path? You're sitting in a cell. You know you're going to die in a few hours. You're trying to cleanse your body of all impurities. Someone puts KFC in front of you. Tell me you don't eat that KFC. Tell me you do not. You're like, okay, I'll just take a bite. My last bite, and then you're all, you just start eating it. You're pouring it into a horse trough, sucking down the bones. How could you, that is so, I mean, I don't care about them. Hopefully that their spiritual existence thing, I don't care how peacefully they went to death. They were murderers. But um, I just think that's so funny. Like I imagine like a monk wanting to be like, no, I will go to the afterlife the same way I came in. No earthly possessions on me or in me. And they're like, here's some mashed potatoes and gravy straight from Kentucky Fried Chicken and a biscuit. And they're like, ah, how can you resist Kentucky Fried Chicken? We don't know. The reporters, there's no article saying they chowed down. And as they were being led to the gallows, they're like, finger licking good. It's the worst advertisement for KFC ever. But anyways, they do get taken to the gallows. She was completely calm. They put the rope around her neck or the noose, to be specific, kick the switch, and they all die. That's the story of Mona Fanday. It's a very, very interesting one, because like I said earlier, it has all the hallmarks of what we think about when we think about modern conspiracy theories. Satanic magic and sacrifice being connected to the rich and the powerful, the music industry. Like, I'm actually surprised this story isn't trotted out more often. When people talk about Katy Perry is... Uh, doing whatever she does nowadays and making music still but Katy Perry I remember early on it was like Dark Horse was her like making some satanic bargain Rihanna's queen of the Illuminati we see this stuff all the time these conspiracy theories and here we have someone who started off as a pop singer became a Boma but actually was also doing the uh, Boma's like supposed to be like a healer but it can really it's a catch-all term She was using her powers to guarantee other people political power for money. So I'm surprised that this story doesn't get brought up more because it really ties into a lot of that stuff. The entertainment world, magic, and secret societies. People at the top using magic. So on that level, I find this story really fascinating. But what I find is even more bizarre about this story is why did she kill him? She, I mean, she had been doing this for a while. She had already had access to these powerful people. Why would she choose to kill this guy? She could have just taken his money, promised him power. If it didn't come about, she goes, oh, the fates, the fates were wrong. The fates, they didn't, they, they didn't, they didn't get the message. Maybe if you gave me a little more money, I could pay the fates phone bill and give him a call. You know, that's what these charlatans always do. So why did they murder him? Because they'd been doing this for a while and they hadn't murdered any of their other clients. Let's put on a conspiracy cap here for a second. I think she murdered him because someone else had a request for an even more powerful spell. One that would require the blood of a gullible, willing instrument. And so to make that spell work for someone else who paid her far more money, she had to execute Mazalon. A dark magic blood spell. It doesn't make sense why she killed him when she had tons of other clients. If she had one client, and it was him, and he almost found out, and she chopped his head off. We've covered stories like that before. The jig is up. I'm going to get found out. I better kill this person before my fraud gets exposed. But she'd been doing this. He was one of a hundred customers. But if someone more powerful than him, with more money, said, I need 
this to happen. And she goes, the only way for that spell to happen is for blood to be spilled. He says, money is no object. But you go, Jason, if that's the case, what was the point of the magic? She got, she got killed. None of the money's going to help. She got killed anyways in the end. When she is sitting there and she's telling people, I will never die. I will never die. There's two ways to read that. One, she has finally become famous. Her name will always be remembered in Malaysian culture. Maybe not. Maybe, maybe she's not a mythological figure, but you know what I mean? That is a name, especially if you are into true crime. You would have never known who M- Mona Fande was had this not happened. So you could say that. That's why she was saying, I will never die. But the other reason why, we could take it as a literal thing, she may not be able to die. She may have that level of power. So is Mona Fande immortal? Because here we are talking about her on a podcast 17 years after this murder. Or is she immortal because she crafted a ritual? The only requirement would be human blood. And she found not only the perfect victim, but she also found someone with enough money to give her a facelift for her new life. Not like her facelift. I'm sure that after the hanging, the facelift was ruined. But you know what I'm saying. So that is a good segue to move on to our next story. So Cole, let's go ahead and put you in that carpenter copter. We got Danielle sitting there as your co-pilot. She got the little headset on, little aviator goggles. You don't have a headset or goggles. Bugs keep hitting you in the eyes. Let's leave behind Malaysia. We are headed out to... Sacramento, California. It's funny, I actually, Weiselhorn on YouTube just the other day said, hey man, are you ever going to tell a story about you fighting the witch? A couple of you guys have reminded me of doing that story over the years. Over the two years I've been doing this show, this, I'm trying, I'm going to try to make it so this doesn't run so long, but there's a little bit of backstory to it. We're going to land there. We're back in time. It's about 2008, 2007, 2008, something like that. At the time I was living with my friend Kara, we were both staying at her cousin Matt's house. And it was basically my job. I was the nanny to her son. Like, she worked. She had a full-time job as a nurse. I didn't have a job at the time. And she's like, hey, I need someone to take care of my son when I'm not at work. And I know you're a total hard nose when it comes to homework and stuff like that. And he has a hard time doing his homework. So I need someone to basically break the bat. Like, I need some... No, literally, I didn't walk around with a bat. I mean, like, just like... That was a Bane reference. He, She needed someone to... She goes, he never does his homework. I need someone who's going to be totally on him about his homework. And I was. He's great. He just turned 18 the other day. Yeah, no, I was pretty hard on him. I'd actually make up extra homework for him. If he didn't do his homework fast enough, I'm like, TikTok, buddy. You're not wasting my time. I'm staying up late to watch Dexter anyways. It's you who's sitting in the living room with no television on. I go, if you get your homework done, you can play video games until you go to bed. But otherwise, you're doing your homework until you're basically falling asleep on the table, bro. That's just the way it goes. Took about a week, and he caught on real quick. I had no give in me when it came to that. But anyways, they're all really cool. They're all doing well, Liam, Matt, and Kara. Now, I was staying there, and I was a layabout, right? <laughs> when I wasn't telling kids, do the homework. I was sleep on the couch, right? I love sleeping on couches, so that's kind of my jam. <laughs> if you got a couch, I'll swing on over. Cole, Danielle, you got a couch? I'm, I'm there. Sleeping on couches, and the reason why that's important, it's not really important in like the grand scheme of things, but I would sleep on the couch a lot, even though I had my own room. Now, Kara's dad was a really nice guy, and he was dating... See, here's the thing. This is really interesting. I remember this detail now. I had not met his girlfriend, but Kara's dad I would see every once in a while. He wasn't in Sacramento area. He lived somewhere else, and he would visit every once in a while. And I remember him talking about his girlfriend was a witch. And he's a really nice guy. I don't want to sound like I'm knocking him or anything like that, but the way he talked about her being a witch, I was always kind of like... Are you bragging? Like, that seems like such a bizarre thing to brag about. Oh, my wife's a train conductor. Like, who cares? Right? Who cares? That's how I feel about witches. They're about as cool as train conductors. I'll tell you the story when I beat up a train conductor. I'm sitting there, and he would be like, oh, my girlfriend's a witch. And I'd be like, yeah, okay, I've, I've fought demons. Like, I didn't actually say that, but you know what I'm saying? That doesn't really impress me, whatever. But again, he's a super nice guy. I'm not trying to knock him. And so she was coming up, the girlfriend was coming up, and I was sleeping on the couch. And they were doing some renovations in the house or something like that. So Kara's dad and 
the girlfriend were coming. We'll just call the girlfriend Samantha. I don't remember. We have Samantha come in. And I remember I was sleeping on the couch. And I woke up. Like something woke me up. It, also, it was noon. <laughs> it was like super late in the day. But I remember something woke me up. And the only way I can describe it. I, I wake up and Samantha's in there with Kara's dad. They're in the kitchen. They're looking at the lighting. Even though we had no interaction with each other, we haven't even said a word to each other yet. It was as if there were two magnets in the room completely repelling each other. It was a very, very weird feeling. I felt like I extended out to fill half the room and something else was pushing against that. Like you could feel the between us now i had not said anything now i have a pretty good read on people i can tell if someone's going to steal money from me i can tell if someone's going to stab me in the face those are just things that you have to do to survive in bad neighborhoods right or or you don't make it but this was different this wasn't me like hanging out with dudes because i've hung out with dudes who do stab people and i know they're not going to stab me so i'm totally fine with it i mean i I would prefer they don't stab (laughs) i would prefer they don't stab anybody but you know what i mean it's not just the fact that they've beat people up violently that's whatever they shouldn't, but they've done it, or they will do it. It doesn't involve me, so I don't feel I'm in danger. But this, I didn't necessarily feel I was in danger, but you could feel that. I remember it. I remember it instinctively. I had not said a word to this woman. She would have had to have been in her 40s. Now, I would have been, back in 2008, I don't know. I can't do math right now. What is that, 12 years, 12 years ago? So I would have been, like, early 30s. She was dev- She might have been older than that. She might have been late 40s. Very attractive woman, but I can feel that energy just like repel. I felt like I was taking up a ton of the room and maybe I always take up a ton of the room. Maybe I always have this giant energy bubble around me, but for the first time I met something of equal strength that was pushing back against it. And I can almost guarantee she felt the same thing because she hated my guts. Absolutely hated hated my guts she didn't say it but i could tell absolute disgust disdain now at first she was there for a couple days they wouldn't stay there but they would spend a long time there they'd spend like eight hours a day there working on stuff and i'm sitting on the couch this is my place dude i'm living here i heard through the grapevine i don't remember if kara told me i think she might have think the samantha might have told kara's dad and the kara's dad told me but i heard it through the grape. and again this is after a good two or three days of me realizing she hates my guts we've maybe said hello to each other i'm sure we did that but apparently and i don't remember it's funny because i can't say for sure that kara told me this or how i got this information but she didn't like the fact that i slept on the couch and that i wasn't helping put in lights and i was like one do you know how dangerous i am around any sort of electricity that's just a disaster waiting to happen two this is my house homie like yeah sure i'm like living with other people and i got this awesome friend matt who's letting me stay there but i've been there for months right i'm taking care of the house i'm taking care of the kid i was paying rent too now that i think about it wait was i paying rent i don't remember it doesn't matter i was paying rent in the love i gave (laughs) to that family but I might have been paying actual cash. I don't remember. My point is, is that whether or not I'm laying on the couch, this is my place. I'm part of this family. You're the interloper. But she thought I should be up and about. Now you're thinking, Jason, is this just a story about a woman who says she's a witch who thinks you're lazy? No, it's not. Because I don't think that's the reason why she didn't like me. I think she couldn't place why she didn't like me. I think she disliked me because of that that energy pushing up against and maybe i was a little more astute that i could figure out because i figured out very very quickly there's something wrong with this lady like this dude may have been talking she was a witch and all this stuff and i thought she was grinding up herbs (laughs) chopping people's heads off in malaysia i don't know whatever she's doing she's putting off some serious voltage she's putting off some serious energy and i think she probably felt the same thing she actually tried to get me kicked out at the very least she didn't want me there when they were working now again if someone was just laying on a couch i'm not pearl from blade i was doing other things but if you came over to someone's house at noon they were sleeping on the couch okay why do you want to get someone removed from that or at the very i remember there was like should i leave 
while she's here. And I was like, hell no, I'm not leaving while someone who's coming here to put in light bulbs. Put in light bulbs, right? No, I'm not leaving. I had no opinion about her in the beginning. I thought it was kind of funny that this guy was bragging about dating a witch. I've met a ton of witches in my life. There's nothing to brag about. When she entered the room, I could tell there was something really off about her. I don't know if she was meaning to exude that much energy or if she didn't have control or if it was just a natural thing. Who knows? I didn't know I had that type of sphere around me until something pushed up against it. But I had enough, dude. I'm just sick and tired of her, dude. I was like, no, done. And I remember one day I'm sitting there. Kara was home. I think Liam was there, too, running around in his PJs or whatever eight-year-olds do. He's all, yippee! Howdy doody's on. And Samantha and the dad were out grocery shopping or picking up more light bulbs. I don't know. It was, at this point, it was like been a week. And I knew that I felt unwelcome in the place. I had been living there for like a year. I felt unwelcome there. I didn't care. Like, I didn't actually feel unwelcome, but people were trying to make me be unwelcome. Her. Samantha was trying to make me not feel comfortable there. Pfft, whatever, bro. But anyways, they're out uh, picking up light bulbs and stuff, buying, buying, buying stuff. And I remember I was sitting there and Kara goes, so what's your take on her? And I was like, well, I, you know, I, she probably actually does have some sort of, we had talked about it before this, but I was like, I think she probably does have some sort of power, not, not anything to be concerned about. But whatever it is, it's not what you would call like a white witch. It's not a good power. And then I go, you know what? Let's salt the place. Kara's like, what? I go, you got a lot of salt? She's like, yeah, yeah. She cooks. Kara was an amazing chef. I go, let's salt the front door. And that'll tell us everything we need to know. Now, that's an old folktale. Evil can't cross salt. A lot of times you'll have rituals that involve circles of salt to protection. I actually made a joke about it a couple episodes ago. I go, how can a demon that's existed since before time began not be able to cross sodium? Like, he existed before sodium even existed, so why would that protect him? But I'm like, dude, as a joke, right? And as a test, we'll just salt the front door. We're going to put salt underneath the doormat outside. We will leave the back door unsalted. So let's see what happens. And she, and Kara's doing it. We're having fun, right? We're having fun. And Kara goes, so she'd done it, and she she didn't really believe in ghosts or anything like that. She was just bored. <laughs> she was just totally bored. She goes, so Jason, what's your hypothesis? What do you think's going to happen? And I said, well, there's going to be one of two things that are going to happen. One, she's just going to walk into the house. And that's going to mean, that's going to mean one of two things. One, the salt doesn't work. It, it's just an old folk tale. Or two, she's not actually a dark witch. There's just some sort of weird personality glitch between me and her. Maybe she has something against couches. Maybe her dad got swallowed up by a lazy boy recliner. I don't know. But that's one possibility. The other possibility is she can't come in the front door for whatever reason. She can't come in the front door. She'll walk all the way into the backyard, open the little gate, walk through the sliding glass door. And Kara's like, that's impossible. I go, it is. It is. But maybe, like, that'll happen. Right? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe she'll pull out her broom and fly over the house. But in my mind, I'm thinking, this is pretty funny, right? <laughs> Either way, this is super funny. I'm actually salting a witch. So I'm sitting in my recliner, and Kara's messing around in the kitchen. She's probably trying to cook something. She's like, dang it, where's all my salt? She's scraping it off the front door. The car pulls up. Kara runs to the window and looks out the window, and I'm sitting in my recliner. Because here's the thing. If I had gotten up and looked out the window, they would have known when something was up, right? And pretty much every part of the story, I'm sitting down. They're like, Jason's on two legs. Uh-oh, something must be going on in that house. I'm sitting down. Kara's kind of in the kitchen. She's looking out the window a bit. And she goes, they pulled up. And I was just, okay, and then what? And she goes, they're just standing there. They're just standing there in the driveway. And like a couple minutes pass. And then the dad walks in. At this point, Kara's not looking out the window anymore. She's not that much of a stalker. The dad walks in, and Kara's curious. She goes, hey, um, where's Samantha? And the dad goes, she doesn't want to come in the house. And the dad walks by. He doesn't see me and Kara look at each other like, what in the world? Now, obviously, I couldn't chime in here. That would make it even more suspicious. But Kara asks her dad, she goes, why won't she come in the house? 
And the dad goes, we pull up into the driveway, and for whatever reason, she just flipped out and started to fight with me. So now I got a da 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 and he walks back outside, and we're like, what in the world is going on? Five minutes pass. Dad comes back in with more supplies. I don't know what's up with that woman. Oh, I don't know why she just acts up sometimes. Me and Kara look at each other. Dad walks back outside. Another five, maybe ten minutes pass. The dad walks in. And then Samantha enters the house. Looking pissed. Looking drained. I never saw her again. Now, I'm not saying she disappeared. I'm not saying she turned into a pillar of salt and Kara used her to cook more food. She never came back to the house. I never saw her again. Now, there's a couple different things we can look at with this story. One, she saw the salt. That was my first thing when I was telling Kara when the dad was walking in and out. I go, maybe she saw the salt. Because that is something you put salt to keep evil out. If you left a home where you know somebody doesn't like you, or I really started off having no opinion about her. I began to dislike her because I could tell how much she disliked me. And then you saw salt outside the door and you were all into that magic stuff. You would know what that salt signified. So my first thing was, I go, maybe she saw the salt and that's why she's mad at your dad. Because it would be the equivalent of a hate crime versus a witch, right? And be like, try to dunk them in their sleep. We got more information about the fight. It really was over nothing. The dad could never understand why she flipped out. And when I say in the driveway, it would have been maybe five feet from the door. They were having this argument right out there. He said she just got mad over nothing. It was nothing. So she could have said, dude, look at what your stupid kids did. They salted the door. And because they think I'm an evil witch, I'll show them. (laughs) Starts electrocuting us. So one, she could have seen the salt and she got offended by that, but it doesn't sound like it because she never brought that up. Two, the salt actually repelled her, but she didn't know what was going on. It might have been the first time she was ever salted, just like this was the first time I had ever encountered anyone. I don't like to give myself superpowers. I think anything that I can do, you can do, as far as like seeing, like I've talked about seeing demons and stuff like that, seeing ghosts. I think anyone can do that. I think everyone probably has a psychic bubble around them like that. I don't know how big mine is in comparison to other people, but that was the first time I'd ever felt, and I'm a people person. I talked to thousands of people throughout my life. It was the first time I'd ever met someone who pushed against my, and I mean, again, it was, I was, it was like a good 10 feet. I could feel energy pushing 10 feet away from me like my barrier was that far ahead of me and I could feel that reverse polarity against it I'm thinking this is my hypothesis is is that it's not like you get to the door and go I can't cross the salt her aura bubble her psychic bubble was touching against the salt and she felt it repelling her and she couldn't figure out why I'm thinking she probably is a witch but she's not an adept one. That's my guess. That's 100% my guess. It seemed like it was very raw energy coming from her, but she wasn't able to tell what was going on. Again, I will flex on her on this to the point where I woke up, whatever was in that room, I woke up to her being eight, 10 feet away and I could feel her energy. Like it, I, and I knew immediately what it was. It's that person. I wasn't going, well, what? Who? Is there any ghosts around? Like I knew immediately this person is pushing against me. And I'm wondering if she, that's what was happening. As she got closer to the door, she felt uneasy and she couldn't figure out why she felt uneasy. She felt more than uneasy. She felt unwelcomed. And so she flips out. She can't understand what's going on. Your brain gets reset to it. When, when we get anxious and when we like freak out, we're really reverting to a childlike state when we're scared of the dark, but now we're adults and we're scared of losing our house, which is fine. You can be scared of losing your house, but that anxious state, we go back to being a child. As a child, you lash out. You lash out at your loved ones, even though it's not their fault. That's what she's doing. Her energy is pushing up against this. And the reason why she was eventually able to come into the house is because the dad had come in so many times and while he was stepping on that floor mat, he was breaking the salt. 
He was moving it enough that there was enough of a gap in it for her to come into that house. But when she came into that house, she looked pissed. She looked tired. She looked like she was just done with everything. She never came back. She never came back. At least I never saw her again. Maybe I was out shopping or doing something and she snuck in. She's pouring salt everywhere. And I'm like, walking through. Because that's really the catch to this thing, right? The hypothesis was that she was a dark witch. She couldn't cross the salt. If it keeps her out, then she's evil. We did it as a LARP. We thought it would be funny. In the back of my mind, I'm thinking it might work, but probably not. Again, how can sodium keep out this person? But it did. At least for 15 minutes. And it exploded her emotions. But she couldn't figure out why. Wouldn't happen to a good witch. It wouldn't happen to a muggle. (laughs) Wouldn't happen to one of those guys. But it would happen to a practitioner of the dark arts. Salt keeps them at bay. At least for a little while. At least until the line is broken. So that's that story of me fighting the witch. Listen, I hope that she's doing well. I hope she hasn't been consumed by an army of goblins or a demon hasn't taken her over. I hope everything's going well. Unless that's what she wants, right? She's a consenting adult. Maybe she loves to be eaten by goblins. I hope everything works out for her. I obviously don't mean her any ill will. I can't say the same that she feels towards me again. Um, she, she started it. She started it. But I wish her the best, right? Maybe she was able to harness her power and get rid of that evil part of it. And I don't know. Maybe she goes on nationwide tours now and talks about, you know, uh, talks about the time that a guy slept on the couch. She does tours for people. It's like, is your husband on the couch all day long? This is how I got rid of him. She didn't, so you basically wasted your money. But you know what I mean? Like, I I wish her the best, right? I'm not going to say, like, oh, no, she's super spooky, and she's hiding in your closet with an axe. I hope she's doing well, and I hope she's able to harness that energy and put it towards good use. I hope everything is working out for her, because if it's not, well, you know the old saying, there's more salt in the world than witches. That's actually not an old saying, but that's actually sounds really dope. That's a new saying. There's more salt in the world than witches, which means good will always triumph over darkness. DeadRabbitRadio at gmail.com is going to be your email address. You can also hit us up at facebook.com slash deadrabbitradio. Twitter is at deadrabbitradio. Dead Rabbit Radio is the daily paranormal conspiracy and true crime podcast. You don't have to listen to it every day. I'm glad you listened to it today. Have a great one, guys.